Hi, I'm Larry Nespoli with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. At New Jersey's community colleges, we believe that our students, as well as all citizens, need to be informed about the important issues facing higher education. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Wells Fargo, Delta Dental of New Jersey. Everyone deserves a healthy smile. New Jersey Council of County Colleges, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. The Mental Health Association in New Jersey. And by Cohn Resnick, Accounting, Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Politicker NJ. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, Steve Adubato here at the Tisch WNET studio in uh, New York City. Uh, let's take a look at this guy. You recognize this guy? Here he is. <laughs> Bob Saget, actor, comedian, author. Uh, right now playing in a very powerful play called Hand to God, which is over at the Booth Theater on 45th Street, playing through uh, January the 3rd. Right. A powerful play because? It uh, was written by a guy named Robert Askin, who grew up in a small town in Texas. And it's a, I play a Lutheran minister in it. It's a, a cast of five people, um, amazing actors, uh, got five Tony nominations, mm. the play did. It's, a, it's about a, a young boy who they're using uh, puppet therapy uh, and puppet practice to help the kids uh, learn things mm. and get out their feelings. But this puppet um, and this boy is a bit troubled. And this, uh, through the puppet, you, you get concerned that it could be a, a bit of a demonic puppet. The byline on the play when they were selling the play was it's, if Book of Mormon and Avenue Q had a baby, it would be <laughs> hand to God. And that's Stephen Boyer, who is a fantastic actor, and he is also playing Tyrone. Mm -hmm. And it is another character, so it's almost a six-person play. And then Geneva Carr and, and uh, Michael and Sarah. This, that, great kids. That's the, uh, great people. And, you uh, saw it. You said you saw the play. I saw it um, with someone I don't date anymore. Not because of the play. Not because of the play. No. For totally no. different reasons. Different reasons and normal reasons. <laughs> and uh, two of my daughters who live here right. in New York, and we were all blown away. And I, I'd seen it about six, six months ago. And then Kevin McCullum, the producer of it, who also produced The Drowsy Chaperone and Avenue Q and Rent. Right. And, and I was in The Drowsy Chaperone. Yes. I actually closed The Drowsy Chaperone on Broadway. I'm a closer. Yeah, yeah you do close. You're closing this I'm one, I'm closing too. this one January 3rd, and then it goes to You're the to Mariano La Rivera of Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, it's going to, closers are as important as openings. That's right. And so, not as important. <laughs> but <laughs> on important. Bro on Broadway, it's yes. more important to have a great opening. <laughs> but um, I'm very proud to be part of this ensemble and to be uh, closing it uh, January 3rd, but then it goes to London in February with a British cast. Mm. Describe the I was going to say a Yiddish cast, but no, I don't no, think that no, would sell as well. No, no. Because it's British a Texan town and the accents are hard no, enough. No, the British is better. Yeah. So eight shows a week, describe that schedule. That is something. It is, uh, you, you're, you're <clears> tired <throat> all the time, and yet once you get there, you can't wait to do it because it's such a wonderful piece. And the people are so amazing that you, mm. your adrenaline just um, is there, and you're in in the play. It's just something that I just um, eight shows. I mean, it's like Hanukkah is eight days. So if I can get through that, you can get through it. You Pastor know. Greg. Pastor Greg. Describe your character. He is a Lutheran minister. He's a good man. He is kind of the uh, moral fulcrum of the play. Mm. He's wanting to help this young boy and his mother. Uh, he lost his father. Her husband passed away. He's trying to help people. He's righteous, um, and everything unravels around him. 
it's, it's not just about him. When you have an actor talk about their part, you know, they could be one of five and they act like the whole thing is from their point of view. No, but it is from your perspective. From my perspective of, of how I am, am playing it. Um, and he is, just, he is a really good man mm. and he wants love and he's a romantic. Mm. And he's trying to use the church and mm. his religion. And um, I wasn't raised a, a Lutheran and I learned a lot and I am learning a lot. And it's really fascinating because you have a belief system that that you want to believe in. And you love when, theater? Sorry for interrupting you, you love theater? Not at all. Um, I love theater. Have you ever done TV? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so <laughs> crazy. My first, my first job in television uh, was on the morning program on CBS at West no. 57th. Get with Rollin Smith and Marriott Hartley. I, I worked with Rollin Smith over at my nine years ago. Go ahead. Man. Great good, man. Great man. Uh, and, what did you do? Uh, I was the third, I was the sidekick. Mark McEwen was the weatherman, and I was, they, they didn't know what to do with me. Bob Shanks, who started Good Morning America, hired me. It was in 1987. Uh, I was the third co-host, and uh, they fired me after five months. They said I was too hot for morning television. <laughs> I got to work one morning, and the ch my chair was gone. That's when you know you're fired from television. <laughs> well, he's just not there. My chair, I was in the sawmill or something. And then uh, I got full house. That, what year? Uh, 87. And it was a miracle because I lost the job, and then my manager and dear friend, still today, Brad Gray, uh, said, "You know, we got the this. Brad Gray. Yeah, we have this opportunity for you." And he's my first manager, and I'm his first client. So we were yeah. children together. We were, he was 20, I was 22. Well, so how did how did they know that you would be a great Danny Tanner, right? Danny Tanner, you know a lot. I'm sorry, I do my research, you, you plus really I watch do. this. I'm sorry, I love the show. You watch Full House. Does it bother you that I love? No. What is, what is I'm not the right demographic? No, you're not. <laughs> it was made for 12-year-old girls, that's well, true. And my wife and I talk about it. She knew you were coming on the show. My wife, Jennifer, is a big fan as well. Well, tell her thank you. Um, she how do they know? Sister? Well, are you I'm looking? available. Are you, are you really looking? Not, not desperately on PBS. I don't think it's a good idea. Well, we're not the right station to look? <laughs> no, actually, yes. You we, look on CNN, but not here. No, I've never really dated a reader before. <laughs> <laughs> we Be do nice have to someone a very, that knows high, the news. very highly educated audience. Um, I, I, that's what I'm looking for. So, so here's the deal. This is my Tinder. This is. <laughs> how did how did they know that you, or did they know that you'd be so great and you'd all be, and John, Stamos, they'd well, all be so is, great together? It's a weird thing that happened. Um, I had known Jeff Franklin, the exec producer, and Bob Boyette, the other exec producer, and Tom Miller, who made Full House, they made, you know, they worked on LeBron and Shirley, they, these were the producers of that show. I used to do the warm up for Bosom Buddies, the Tom Hanks, Peter Scolari show. I was the audience warm up. Is that right? So they knew me from then, and then I got in a Richard Pryor movie, an amazing Richard Pryor called Critical Condition, and it was a Paramount movie, and they had seen me in that, Tom Miller saw me in that, and thought I would be right for Danny Tanner, and Jeff Franklin wanted me for it after Bill Maher turned him down, and, um, Bill Maher turned him down. Yeah, because that he right? Did, yeah, he didn't want to dust bust and hug people for ten years. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he, 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 uh, he. Okay, I'm. No, he's very proud to say he turned it down. Okay, um, so. But he's. But I'm, I'm a different. I'm an, a comedian. And my my hard drive is a comedian. I I love acting. So when I'm acting, I'm a thousand percent an actor. So the part of Danny Tanner on Full House, I said I want to, I made him more Felix Unger-like. It wasn't even like that in the script originally. I made him a hugger and... It made, okay, yeah, but you also do stand-up, you do so many other things. You and St John Stamos. Yeah. Chemistry right away? Uh, no. We weren't that friendly the first uh, four years. We liked each other. Four years? Yeah, because it went eight years. <laughs> and then, the, I mean, he had a different life than I had. I, was, I, had, I had a wife and a, and, a, and a baby and then another child. And I always liked him. It was, he taught me a lot. I mean, he's got chops as an actor, yeah. which people can see now even more so on this new show, Grandfather, yes. which I'm guesting on yeah, January 5th. I was just going to say that you're right, January yeah. 5th, you're doing that. Yeah, well, what it's is funny. really an unattractive guy like Stamos, too, when he's you know, not he's working? He's so attractive, it's annoying. It bothers I, you. I don't even know. I don't even <laughs> see him that way anymore. I, I'm so close to him. After about four years, we started to go through all this life stuff together, and Dave Coulier, my other yes. brother from the show, who I knew since he was 17. And our sisters got sick, and Dave lost his sister, and John's, thank God, his sister did not uh, lose her life. Um, our parents passed away, all kinds of stuff that happened. 
um, just normal lunacy of life, relationships, and we became very, very close. And John is one of the best friends and one of the sweetest and smartest people. And we all have devils. I've got, uh, boy, do I have a lot of them. Who doesn't? That's I'm in a play hand to God. It deals with the devil and what is what is it. And it, yet, um, I don't know why I went back to hand to God. John's, John's coming to see it. That's how good oh, a is. friend. I'm trying to get us back to how much I love no, John okay. Stamos. But, 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 but you have a genuine... Here's He's, my he'll thing. be here in a couple weeks, and, he, but, and we'll be we'll be cuddling. But real friendships yeah. in this business hard to come by. Very much so. Do you have a lot of good good friends in this business? Three. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. It, 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 it's hard to come by. They say I have an on-air can... friend here at, at PBS, uh, Raphael Pimeron. You know, I call him my on-air brother because it's real. Right. John it's is it's real. It's real. And they say if you can if you have you can count all your friends on one hand but you have 3 you're missing two fingers. Mm. That yeah. would have been a joke under other circumstances. I'm sorry. I've just yeah, No, you did the right thing. Place. No. I'm the different place. No, you're um, you're smart. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. Your stand up, I have to do this. Your stand up is absolutely filthy. Can be. Stop it. It is. My Stop. last Stop. special I've, my last you... special was not as dirty. Did you see it? I had uh, always done stand up since I was 17 years old. Rodney Dangerfield was a friend of mine. He put me on the Young Comedian special. I was always irreverent. I said weird stuff. I didn't curse a lot, but I did when I was doing club work. Cause, and then I was in clubs for 10 years before I got any work. And I just followed my rudder. I don't, and, and it's changed a lot. Like I'm, a, I'm going on tour after mm. I'm done with this play. I'm oh, going to go out on tour starting in January, February, March, and I'm going to put a new special together, and that's what I'm working on, new material, but it's hard, because all I'm doing is hand to God. Right. And that is what you- can't be doing you, both. You can't even think, I just am, I'm Pastor Greg. Yeah, <laughs> mind if I ask you about your foundation? I know I'm jumping around. Please, Please. no, I Can I do you. that real quick? Yeah, thank you. I'm on the board of directors of the Scleroderma Research Foundation, and I have been on it for about 12 years, and uh, I lost my sister to the disease scleroderma, which is hardening of the skin. Um, I lost her, I guess, in 94. And I've been uh, working on the board and championing. We've raised a lot of money. We've raised over $30 million in the past 20 years. For research? Uh, for research, all for research. Um, and it goes to the leading centers that specifically treat scleroderma. And there are Johns Hopkins and UCSF and Stanford and a couple of other centers. And we're doing a benefit um, here in New York, um, uh, December 8th. Uh, huge success, uh, already sold out, which is wonderful, and we raised 600000 in L.A. Mm. with our last benefit, and it's all comedians that come. It's called Cool Comedy Hot Cuisine, and just generous people. And the name of the organization again is? Scleroderma Research Foundation. Perfect. There's another foundation also, but we're the Scleroderma Research Foundation. Mind if I tell folks again about the play? Please. I know I jumped around a lot, I'm I, sorry. No, my mind always jumps around. You're my new friend. If I lived here, you'd have a fourth friend. Hand to God, <laughs> Pastor Greg, the great... Bob Saget. It says actor, comedian, author, but he's also a philosopher, a lot of things. So this is one-on-one. -on -one. It's a great show because of people like Bob Saget. Be right back right after this. Thank you. You're good. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Joanne Reed, who is uh, the author of Fracture, Barack Obama, The Clintons, and The Racial Divide, and also an MSNBC national correspondent. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is a fascinating book. Thanks. By the way, I'm a big fan of your work over at MSNBC. You do good work. Thank you. This book is controversial. <laughs> I didn't know that there was a divide. Really, is there a fracture? <laughs> I know, who knew? You know, anytime you write about race, it is controversial, um, especially in the current climate. There's just so much happening. Um, and, you know, I wrote about it from the perspective of the Democratic Party, but really the perspective of the country, because we've really had an extraordinary 50-year journey from where we were in the 1960s to today. And you know what? We're still not out of the woods. Yeah, by the way, you can tell we're talking about race, and uh, you can tell we're actually live here in... Uh, Lincoln Center, There's sirens around us. Um, it's interesting because the question of race, as we do this program, um, as the end 2015, we'll be seeing it uh, later as well in 2016. 
How honest do you believe we are, Joy, about our discussion about and around race? You know, I think everyone believes they're being honest about it, but everyone's perspectives are so different um, that any poll you look at shows that when we talk about issues of race, white Americans and black Americans, just generally and broadly, are, are speaking complete, two completely different languages and seeing two different sets of facts. And there's really no common agreement on just basic things like mm. whether racial discrimination is still active in the country. Very different numbers when you poll white Americans and African Americans or when you poll Republicans and Democrats. And so we've got so many different divides mm. within the country on the matter, whether it's between traditional Republicans and Tea Party members or whether it's between uh, middle of the road uh, Catholics mm. and evangelical Protestants. There are so many different divides just on the basic facts about where we are as a country when it comes to race that we can't have one conversation. But, but, but you know, it's interesting because even within the African-American community, one of the arguments you make in this book is that there are some African-American leaders or leaders in the African-American community, like if you look at public broadcasting, people like Tavis Smiley, um, an icon in our world, has been incredibly critical of the president in part on the subject of race. Yeah. Because? And even before uh, Barack Obama became president, I think the critique that Tavis Smiley was making of then-Senator Obama really began during the campaign and really ratcheted up during the Jeremiah Wright controversy. Uh, it started with the then-Senator, Senator Obama, declining to make his presidential announcement at a forum that Tavis Smiley was holding at the same time that Obama was in Springfield making this big announcement. That sort of personal tension then erupted really into the media landscape as Tavis Smiley began mounting really sharp critiques on the basic question of whether Barack Obama, given his background, really understands where most African Americans are in their lives and whether he could really lead or reflect them. And that became an increasingly harsh critique when both he and Cornel West mm. really began questioning, once Barack Obama was president, just his basic humanity toward African Americans, whether he was had a fear of free black men, as, Tav, as uh, Cornel West said, whether he was, as Cornel West said, a mascot, a black mascot black of Wall enough. Street. Dare and, I use that term? Yeah, and it became just incredibly personal. But in the beginning, it started with something a lot of African Americans were doing, which was questioning, can this person with this exotic background, is he an, actually an African American in the real sense? So, so if I use that term, black enough, is that the appropriate term? That's what people were asking. You know, I was doing radio back in 2007 when Senator Obama announced, and you definitely had questions that people were asking, you know, where did this guy come from? He's not a civil rights leader. He doesn't have a background in the church. He hasn't been in politics in the black sphere. Who is he? Where did he come from? And is he like us? And you definitely had those questions when you combined his background in Hawaii, um, the fact that he's lived so many years of his life overseas as a young kid, and just his whole deportment just came across to a lot of African Americans as not like them. So those questions had to be answered along with the question of whether it was even fathomable that he could win. And a lot of African Americans doubted that a black man could be president of the United States in 2008. But then you have so many whites who will not accept Barack Obama as their president simply because, and by the way, there are some who disagree with President Obama on policy. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some who will absolutely, categorically not accept him as their president, as our president, because he's black. Yeah, and I think that there are components of the reaction to Barack Obama that were political that no Democrat who won that office was going to get the respect or the acceptance from his political opponents. Um, but then there are part of it that were almost hysterical, sort of, uh, you know, insinuations that he'd somehow stolen the White House, that he was an imposter, not really an American. He wasn't really born here. The birther movement. Is that, that about race, though? I think underlying, yes. It's about the othering of this person who um, I think some of his opponents wanted to portray as fundamentally alien to the United States, alien to the American experience. And some of that definitely is racial. So, so it's so interesting because then if it were Colin Powell, mm -hmm. would it have been okay for some of those folks, you think? And is that part of the racial discussion? You know, it's interesting. Not the right black 
American? I right. Mean, I, I and not the right views. About. You know, Colin Powell had the, the respect of a lot of people on the right until he endorsed Barack Obama. And then you started to get criticisms of Colin Powell, that he's a race man, that he didn't have any legitimate reasons for endorsing Barack Obama. Except for? That he's black. And you had the, some of the same voices that go after Barack Obama and have used very derogatory terminology toward him, then turning on Colin Powell and saying that he basically is an unintelligent man who made a decision to endorse mm. the president or endorse the then senator that was only based on race. You know, as we're doing this program at the end of 2015, it's risky because when you talk about the presidential race, so many things change. It's mm -hmm. the nature of it. And you know that as someone who talks about politics all the time on MSNBC. But, and I don't know how long Ben Carson stays in the race or if he is or isn't. I don't know Donald, Donald Trump. I don't know any of that. How much, how much of, um, well, let me ask you this about Ben Carson. Why do you think so many whites are willing to not just accept but be enthusiastically supportive of Ben Carson? Yeah. I think part of it is that he is an evangelical Christian and is very assertive about his Christianity so that you have a lot of white evangelical Protestants who love the fact that he really asserts his Christianity. But I think part of it is some of what a lot of white Americans liked about Barack Obama in 2004. There is this sense that the unaggrieved black man is sort of the ideal black man, that the black person with no needs and no asks of the country is the right guy that you want in leadership or that you want in public, because he's going to celebrate America and only celebrate its triumphs and never mm. point out its flaws. That was the expectation I think a lot of white Americans had of Barack Obama. He'd bring the country together around a shared mm. enthusiasm for how well we'd done in our past. Ben Carson is sort of the ultimate unaggrieved black man. He doesn't present any grievances on the basis of race. He simply says, I made it strictly due mm. to God, and that's all I needed, and that I didn't need the government, even though, you know, as a young kid, as an impoverished kid in Detroit, sure. his family definitely used government programs, but he sets that aside and says that all I needed was Christ, and I think that really resonates with the right. Joe, I don't know what's going to happen with Hillary Clinton either, but you do talk significantly about her issues with the black community. What are they? I think at this point, Hillary Clinton's done and a excuse lot. Excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. Are they different from Bill's? Yes, I think they are. I think Bill Clinton lost a lot of favor with African Americans because he shocked a lot of people with this really bluntly racial talk that sounded like a Southern politician in a bad way um, when they were losing that election in the primaries in 2008. Where you stand is where you sit sometimes. Absolutely. And the desperation and comparing Barack Obama to Jesse Jackson and some of the things he said that just struck up an uh, ill tone note. And that washed over Hillary Clinton. But what the Clintons did that was smart is that Hillary joined the team. When she was offered Secretary of State, she took it and really became an Obama team member and is seen to have been an enthusiastic and loyal member of the Obama team. As long as she's seen that way, I think that she's inoculated herself from some of the anger. But I can tell you, I talk to African-American mm. women in particular who are still not quite there with Hillary Clinton and who still bear some resentment uh, against both her and against her husband, against the former president, for the way they treated Barack Obama in 2008. She still has to make the sale. Hillary Clinton has the advantage of name recognition. African Americans mm. know her. They know Bill Clinton. But she still has to close that deal. The Obamas and the Clintons do not like each other at the core? I would say that they're different. I think that the two men have a very fraught relationship. They have a uh, cordial relationship. I think they've come to an understanding as two people who've shared that office and who know what its burdens are and its challenges. I think they respect each other. I would not say that I found a lot of people who say there's a lot of affection there. I think on the Hillary Clinton-Obama side, there is a lot more warmth. They really came to work together and have a really solid, decent friendship. Michelle Obama friendship. and Hillary? No, um, Mrs. Clinton and Barack Obama. How about Michelle Obama? And Mrs. Clinton. That is a lot murkier. It's really not. I didn't talk to a lot of people who knew quite what that relationship was. I know that the person that Mrs. Obama is really close to is Jill Biden. And the Bidens and the Obamas have an incredible bond of affection that I don't think is the same as the relationship between Race the Obamas. Race doesn't matter as much there. No. And you know what? There's something about Joe Biden. He's had his issues. Because when Anita Hill um, was challenging Clarence Thomas, he was on Clarence Thomas' side in a really negative way. But somehow... When you get into a room with African Americans and Joe Biden, it's like what people say about Bill Clinton. He's comfortable and he's a guy in the room that fits in. And he does have a really, really close mm. personal <clears throat> friendship with the president. I need to ask you this, because I'm struggling with it myself. Yeah. Black Lives Matter. I don't want to play a word game. I'm not gonna I'm not a person who gauges in semantic splitting. 
when the question is asked, do black lives matter more? I, of course they do not, because I can't tell my four kids that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that is the message, is it? Well, the, the sort of unused word at the end of Black Lives Matter is not more, it's two or also. And so the implied message of Black Lives Matter is to say, in the landscape as these young activists see it, Black Lives Matter less. And so it's an assertion that Black Lives Matter too, they matter also. The word they're using isn't more. And is it unrealistic for whites and others to expect leaders in the African-American community when some in the Black Lives Matter movement hold rallies here in New York and other places across the country calling for the murder of police officers to speak up and condemn that. Is that reasonable to expect? And if not, does that contribute to a positive dialogue around race? Well, the interesting thing, and I covered um, that march. It was a breakaway rally away from the march, which I was actually covering on the ground, 40,000 right. people peacefully marching through New York City. This breakaway crowd that went up on, a, a, on really the opposite side of where Macy's is, they were in a completely different area from the rest of the marchers, and who started this really sort of vicious chant. Well, Two they seconds, go ahead. They weren't part of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a lot of things. It's a lot of different pieces, and it's not one organized group. And leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement that we know, the prominent leaders, absolutely did condemn that. And I don't yeah. think we can hold all white Americans sure. responsible for the bad guys, for the Dylan Roofs of the world. You can't yeah. hold all of Black Lives Matter responsible for one fringe By the way, it was wrong, unfair of me to bring that up at the end of the program. We should talk oh, about that's it okay, longer. So I wish you nothing but the Thank best. Thank you so much. The book is, book is called Fracture. It's a great book. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. That was great. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Wells Fargo, Delta Dental of New Jersey, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, PSENG, the Mental Health Association in New Jersey, and by Cone Resnick. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I am Dominique Lee. I was recognized in 2015 with the Russ Berry Award for making a difference for helping revitalize our school system in Newark. The award had a significant impact in my life. Help us identify and honor the unsung heroes in your New Jersey community who go unnoticed in their efforts to make a difference in the lives of others. You can nominate someone today for the Russ Berry Award for making a difference. The deadline for nominations is February 19, 2016.